Uh, hi, I'm Ian Mean. I'm content director for local world newspapers in this region. Uh, and this evening I'm interviewing Sir Richard Broadbent. Sir Richard is chairman of Tesco. He's been chairman for two years now. And Sir Richard is the uh, latest speaker uh, in the University of West of England Distinguished Address Series, which the Bristol Post is privileged to sponsor. Okay, Sir Richard, uh, how do we get to love Tesco again, as we did for many years? Well, I appreciate you put it in terms of how do we get to love Tesco, but of course it's primarily Tesco's job to become lovable. Um, and, you know, that of course has a lot to do with how we, what we sell, how we sell it, but for me, it's fundamentally about what we are. Um, it's always been the case, and I think more so today, that when people shop, they want to know what they're identifying with. And Tesco has a track record of getting that right. <clears throat> it used to be seen what it was, being straight, being honest, and that's where we need to get to, so that we are humble as well as being respected. Mm -hmm. for but when uh, Sir Jack Cohen first set up those early stores, um, he had uh, a real value in mind, didn't he? Have, have you, do you think, lost the sense of value, good value? I think it's actually deeply rooted in, it, in the DNA of Tesco. We haven't lost it, no. I do think, um, to be candid, that there was a period when Tesco slightly lost touch with its customers. It was a little bit focused on the, on the numbers, if you like. And of course, for any business, the numbers are the output, the outcome of what you do. You have to focus on what you do. You've got to make that the worthwhile thing and let the numbers follow. And so, that's where we're getting back yeah, to. so how do you get those customers who've lost a bit of faith in you back? One of the things which is happening at the moment is that customers are talking to each other more and more. I mean, we can, we can seek to talk to customers, as we've always done. But compared to even five years ago, customers talk to each other, they talk to us, they talk to other retailers as well as us talking to them. And we have to be part of that dialogue. And it's not as if we can say, this is what we do. We can't, we can't lecture to them. We just have to be open. We have to be transparent. We say, here, this is what we are. Come and see us, and see if they come. Yeah, you're the biggest, but most people would say you're no longer the best. If if you look at your rivals, it's white hot the rivalry, isn't it, in the supermarket area? The competition in the retail sector at the moment is, is very very intense, and it is changing. And it's changing partly because economic conditions are are and have been tough. But it's also changing because of the effects of technology and social media. The number of times people go shopping is changing. They're going on, on to shop more frequently for smaller amounts. Some of it's online. They're using their cars less. So we're facing these twin changes of, of economic pressures and changes in behavior. And that has led to an intense competition, not just amongst the established players, but also new entries. But, but price is not the most important thing, is it? Price is, has never actually been the most important thing. It is always very, very important. One of the things about our price promise, where we we offer to match the prices of other supermarkets for our own brand as well as some branded goods, is not to say we're going to be the cheapest supermarket ever. It's just to take that issue off the agenda. You can shop at Tesco and not have to worry that you're going to get you know, something which is uh, more expensive than the other of our major competitors. The equation is really to do with price, quality, and service, because those are the three things that constitute value. And, and shoppers are very, very sensible. They understand that. Now, those are three important things. Which do you think is the most important to the shopper? I think it's the equation. I think the shoppers are very good at understanding value. And if you try and use work, weight price and, and let quality go, you, you, you get their catch. They catch. So Tesco, does it stand for value as, say, against Asda? Because some would say, well, Asda sells itself on price. And some would say, well, that's value. That's what we call value, price. I think what Tesco truly stands for is inclusion. Tesco is for everyone. You can come to Tesco, and whoever you are, whatever you are, you're welcome. And whatever you want to spend, you will find something that suits you. And that is not true of anybody else or any other store. And it's very, very important to it. I think the inclusiveness of Tesco is truly one of the things which makes it different. Right. Now, just looking uh, before the analysts came in the other day, I was just looking in the Daily Telegraph, and they, that headline was, we need to make Tesco loved again, says Clark. My, my view is that you, your chief executive comes over as someone who, you know, does talk about values well, he knows the shop floor well, 
but what's the big idea that's going to get you there? What's the big idea that's going to get you back really in front so the consumer really is proud again to be there? I wish there was one big idea, one silver bullet. Here we are, and with one bound, they're free. And of course it's not like that. Um, one of the most important things that Philip is doing at the moment, actually, is just exhibiting value leadership. So there's many things which we are doing, and I'll come on to those in a moment. But perhaps the most important thing, when you have a large organization, we're talking about 300,000 people, is to recognize that the behavior of every single one of those 300,000 people is what's going to make you a success or not. We can get the right products and the right prices and the right, but it's the people. So Philip spent a lot of his time, quite rightly, literally, simply leading those people by, by example, which of course he can do well because he started working at Tesco store yeah. when he was 15 years old. Yeah. And now if you have that, if you get that right, then of course you can do all the things you need to do to make your offer you know, the, the best value offer. Right? So how does his influence then get down to the Tesco checkout girl uh, on a <coughs> Sunday morning who's perhaps had a good night out, a bit bleary, perhaps is a little bit grumpy. How does it get down to that level? It's a big organisation, and clearly Philip himself cannot go around <laughs> stores every morning. We have over 3,000 of them. It's a big job. Um, technology helps. Uh, I should say Philip is a very, very active man. He does get around more stores than you might think. Technology helps. There's a lot of webcasts, a lot of internal Yammer, there's a lot of um, internal blogging. A lot of people connect with Philip. Um, when we did our presentation to the city analysts on Tuesday... That was this week. Yeah, the yeah. last week, a big presentation, all the city analysts, we did it in the stock exchange. That was fed live to almost every Tesco store. A lot of people were watching that. Uh, and quite right, if you listened to what Philip was saying, there were several points in that presentation where he spoke directly to the colleagues in the stores because he knew them listening, he wanted them to listen. And so that connection is sustained all the time. And of course there is a, a cascade through a management team a management team, which of course has to be a real team, has to live those values with them. It's, it's a management challenge, but it's a, it's a substantial one. But like any other challenge in this area, values is about human leadership. Yeah. Looking at online, um, and when we look at the growth of, of companies like Amazon, I mean, within five years' time, do you see Tesco trying to deliver that sort of service, literally, with all sorts of products? This is really about the consumers as much as about Amazon. I mean, Tesco has to be in the business of meeting what customers want. The biggest challenge, if you like, that the board in Tesco addresses itself to day by day is to allocate its resources really between competing for the way the retail world is now and in making sure we emerge as leaders in the world which is coming. Because the retail world which is coming is very different from the current world. Um, the, the, the sort of the embracing word for it is multi-channel. We've been talking for a long time about that. But all I say about multi-channel is it's not just technology, it's not just about having different ways of uh, buying and selling and offering your goods, it's about behaviours. It's about the fact that consumers are now wanting a completely different level of service, a different level of convenience, a different level of housing provided, a different experience. And our challenge is to provide that and to become the multi-channel retailer of the UK. Mm. It really matters to us to do that. Mm. Now, day by day as chairman, you, you ran a huge government department in customers and excise. Uh, you were deputy chairman, correct me if I'm wrong, of, of Barclays. So you have huge experience of leadership. Is the leadership in the store level right? I mean, Philip may be a great guy and you've got obviously very talented people, but isn't the pe isn't it the people on the ground that are important? You're, you're right, it's the people on the ground who are important. Uh, and it's a big ship and you don't change a big ship overnight. Uh, people who work in any business, and Tesco is no different, are very, very sensible. They, 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 you know, if somebody says to them, I want you to be different tomorrow, they're not going to be different tomorrow. They're going to watch. They're going to watch and see what you do. And they're going to watch and see what you actually reward, and what you actually praise and what you don't praise. And if you can win their trust and their confidence, most of them will come around. Maybe a few won't, that's, that's, a, that's a management problem. But most will come around. But you have to, when I say lead them, I don't mean in a patronizing sense, but you have to win their trust and walk with them along that way, show them what you want. And you as chairman, what do you try and provide from your experience? In terms of the stores, I mean, that really is Philip's job, mm. not mine. And, and if I was to talk a bit more on my job, um, mm. part of my, or a big part of my job, in a sense, is to, is to manage the board, almost in that spirit. 
Um, there's a lot of talk about Forbes in the UK corporate scene in the moment. In fact, I'll be talking shortly about the move to a larger audience. A lot of talk about policing and challenge. And that is not my concept of a board at all. A board is a joint endeavour uh, between people who have different roles on it, executives and non-executives, but it's fundamentally a joint endeavour. And the chairman's role is to create an environment where there's sufficient respect, sufficient trust, that difficult questions can be tabled and held, because very few difficult questions can be answered quickly, within a group of people who trust and respect each other enough to wait until the solutions emerge. And that's a big part of my job, is to create that entity at the top of Tesco, which can support the endeavor which is engaged in. And how do you gauge your own success, Richard? I mean, month after month, how do you calculate, well, that's been a good month for us. <laughs> I think that um, I have a vision, or Tesco has a vision, I'll put it more deeply than that. I share a vision with Tesco. Um, I don't, in fact, track the sort of month by month share price or the, you know, the, the, the short term measures. They are important, but I don't ignore them either. Um, what I tend to track are events um, that I think relate to that vision, whether they're positive or whether they're negative. And there are, uh, there are, of course, some of both. And those events can be quite disparate. Some of them are financial, some are behavioural, some of them are external. Um, let me try and give you an example. Mm. Um, so I go and see a supplier, for, a, a, one of Tesco's suppliers at least once a month. I don't go by myself, I don't take anybody with me, I just go and I say, how, how are you getting on? How are you finding Tesco? And they tell me, pretty, pretty, well, pretty candidly. And I've done that every month for 24 months. And it gives me a very good sense of whether or not the changes we're trying to make are flowing through. And I, I do that, I do that in many different respects. That would be one way of doing it. Mm. Um, and what about, so you talk about events, and I've talked to you previously before we started this conversation about the terrible Somerset floods right. and how one of our papers, the Western Daily Press, has actually been involved in a big campaign, and you're helping down there. In mm. fact, you've given us £10,000 towards that campaign, you've got, most important thing, you've got a lot of logistic yeah. help for these farmers and you're raising money in the stores. And is that important to you in terms of values, that sort of cooperation? It's so important. I mean, we operate in many, many communities in the UK. Um, if we are going to be part of those communities, if we're going to be part of society in the UK as a whole, we have to be with those people. We have to be part of the community. We have to be part of the society we operate in. Mm -hmm. And when there's a flood, you know, we're with them. Uh, we, can, we can certainly raise money. We have the scale to try and do that. But as you said, in many places, we have quite significant logistical infrastructure. We have lorries which carry things back and forwards. We have deliveries. We can take things away. We can make things happen in a practical way. And that is very important for us to be able to contribute our resources in that way when events like that happen. And you've had experience in Thailand, haven't you? There were those terrible flooding. floods in Thailand, what, three years ago now, I think, which were you know, even greater, I think, than the Somerset levels. Yeah. And of course, that country has less infrastructure and less resources. And it was quite close to being a humanitarian disaster. And there, we actually opened up our stores to people. We gave them bottled water. We allowed people to actually, just many of our employees actually lived in our stores for some period of time because they couldn't get out. One of my favourite um, photographs, actually, is of a, of a shopper leaving a store in Thailand on a, on a walkway made of um, shopping trolleys made on their sides, with water on both sides, carrying two bags of shopping. She's got this huge smile on her face because she can get her groceries from, you know, could we, we've got her in and got her. That yeah. matters so much in the community. Yeah. And how, uh, I mean, that's a great example. How can you really get into communities? How can Tesco really reach them? I know you have... Um, ambassadors in your stores, but mm. how can you really get involved with the life of those communities? Yeah. It's a really important question for us. One of the things we did last year was we very really do this. We, at Tesco, like any business, has a set of stated values. We added a new value last year, which we thought about for a long time on the board. And, and that value is we will use our scale for good. Now, it has many, many repercussions that, which I would, but if you think about a value, it's meant to inform behaviors at every level. Um, and one of the things we did was then to, to say there's, there's going to be three particular areas we'll focus on. And, and they're going to be youth opportunity. Because we, we work in many areas, including, for example, Bristol, where there are people who, would, who need work and they haven't got the skills to get it, and we help them. But health, we, we sell food. We sell sometimes fattening food. We need to get involved in that. And we, we identify these areas where we focus our attention. 
and then we try and wrap the community activity. I mean, leaving aside special events like the floods, we wrap our community activities around these two or three activities because you have to focus. You have to say, look, in broad terms, it matters to us that we use our scale for good, and we're going to focus on these two or three areas to, to do that. Right. Now, what about food producers? Um, we're in a, a region here producing fantastic food with lots of niche food producers. Um, supermarkets like Tesco are often criticised for not encouraging that, those small retail, small producers. Now, you visit producers, mostly big people, I guess, big customers. But how are you going to develop that sort of yearning for local food uh, and drink, which we produce in the Southwest, probably as well as anyone in the country? One of the things we've been doing for uh, probably two years now, uh, which is part of really trying to shorten supply chains and in response to customer demand, is to make sure that our local stores stock some array of local produce. Um, we have to, of course, make sure that they have the capacity to produce the amount we sell. And, and sometimes yeah. that's something yeah. where we can help them. Sometimes it's something where we invite them. Yeah. Um, and we do help a lot of our suppliers uh, in those respects. If we can build up a relationship with a supplier, we will offer them a very, very good local market. We have over 100 suppliers, for example, in, in the region, in the, west, in the western region. We have three in Bristol itself, in the, in the town. Um, we can help, we can build them up. And we can do something else. We can often, if they wish, take their products and begin to distribute them elsewhere. Uh, and not just in the UK, actually, I mean, in, in, many, in many other places as well. So for a supplier, if we can form a good relationship, we can both satisfy that appetite for local produce. We can also offer the supplier the potential to expand. Okay. And the big message for customers now, looking at Tesco, um, thousands and thousands of more, more customers than any other go to your supermarket, what's the message to them? I think the thing that I'd like to say to them is that we are trying to understand very clearly about ourselves, and we're doing that because we want to be more than you want. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not something we can just say airbrush out and say, here it is, it's all changed. We want to be honest about this, we want to be real, there are still things that go wrong, I get letters every day which tell me about it, but we don't try and hide anything. We want to be open, we want to be open about ourselves, we want to be open to you. And if that works, then come and try it. Sir Richard, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you, I enjoyed it.